If there's one thing all video game characters are into, it's self-improvement. But is there anything they can teach us about doing it in real life? All of the most popular modern video games involve getting better at stuff. It could be shooting people, snowboarding, stabbing people, skinning animals, punching people, climbing things, or throwing grenades at people. The common theme in everything from Far Cry to Kingdom Come Deliverance is that you start as an under-equipped, under-skilled simpleton and gradually grind yourself into the world's most elite, well, whatever. But how you do this in-game and how it's done in real life are wildly different, for more reasons than you might expect. In this video, we've consulted Joel Snape, creator of self-help website Live Hard, and a man who's written five books, competed in three strongman competitions, and helped us make a video about fighting, which you can watch here. Here are seven lies games tell us about self-improvement. In games, simply putting the time in is enough to see you level up in almost every area. Because developers have a vested interest in shepherding you towards greatness, it's more fun that way, just repeating an activity again and again will lead you up the old skill tree. And it's tempting to think that things work like this in real life, right? After all, if you spend every single Saturday going running or practicing karate, you'd eventually get loads better at it, right? So yeah, if you give it a minute, you can probably think of half a dozen things that you've been doing for almost your entire life without actually getting appreciably better at them. Maybe making omelets, driving, uh, swimming, playing video games. The difference is, you get to what researchers tend to call a level of conscious competence, and then you stop worrying about trying to improve. You can drive well enough not to crash your car into a lamppost, you can talk to your boss without deliberately offending him, and that's fine, that gets you through life. The difference between what you're doing and what, let, let's say, really influential CEOs or Olympians are doing is that they never get satisfied with that level of progress. They keep grinding, but that grinding is really, really hard to do, and that's why you, most people get to a certain level of competence and things, and then just stop. Even in games where just playing isn't enough, progress is usually pretty simple. You either need to collect enough stamina wheels, heart boxes, magic bananas or whatever to progress, or you need to repeat an activity just a whole bunch of times. In real life? Well, this actually might make you worse rather than better. Here's Joel again. So among scientists, just doing the same thing over and over again and hoping to get better is called naive practice, which isn't a very nice term, but it's why some people get stuck on self-improvement plateaus for weeks or months or even years. The problem is that just doing the same thing over and over again, like playing a game of tennis or playing the same bit of music again and again, isn't actually going to help you improve. A good example is the study of chess. Playing hundreds and hundreds of games of chess isn't actually as helpful for your long-term chess development as, say, looking at one or two games by serious grandmasters, trying to understand why they've made the decisions they have, and going into really in-depth study on that. A better move is what's called purposeful practice, which is laser-targeted work focused at eliminating weaknesses and getting better at one or two little things that are hampering your game. But the problem with it is that it's not much fun, and it's certainly miles away from the kind of entertaining experience that games are struggling to provide in a really competitive marketplace, which is why they don't do it that often. So practice doesn't make perfect men after all, but just like in games, there's another level to all of this. The final level is something that's called deliberate practice, which has been kind of misinterpreted recently thanks to being included in Malcolm Gladwell's book about the 10,000 hour rule and a few other places. It's something that you can kind of do on your own and work out as you go. Um, the fact is that deliberate practice in the strictest sense, as it's explained by the guy who invented the term, Anders Ericsson, um, who's probably the foremost researcher in self-improvement theory, is that it has to be designed by a coach who really knows what he's doing and is very focused on making you better at that thing. Also, that thing has to be really well understood, like chess or playing the violin. So it's very difficult to do in another field that it hasn't been going for hundreds of years. So eSports is an interesting example because they would tend to say that if you're not participating in an activity that's been well established for like decades, then the best practices for it aren't well established enough for you to get better. But I would certainly say that there's been enough man hours plowed into eSports now that the very best players and the very best player coaches probably do have quite a good grasp of what it takes to be good at certain games. But I think the most crucial thing to say about deliberate practice is that it's even less fun than purposeful practice and it's actually really hard, which is why almost nobody is Tiger Woods.
For obvious reasons, it's pretty rare that games ever discourage you from playing them anymore. Sure, there's the odd, shouldn't you take a quick screen break warning, but ultimately, every title is interested in keeping you invested. Whether they're using psychological tactics to keep that neat, sweet dopamine flowing, click the link to watch a video on that, or just gently nudging you towards that life-changing new plasma rifle. In real life, however, as Joel explains, you might just be best off having a nice snooze instead. So part of the problem with deliberate practice is that it's really hard. Um, and what they found in numerous studies is that actually, Guys like top violinists who've reworked their lives to be able to take afternoon naps and have long periods of rest between really, really intensive bouts of study actually will outstrip the guys who are doing the same amount of study but not able to have the sleep and recuperation. So again, this is something you don't really see in games. A game like Destiny, for instance, will just keep, encourage you to keep playing and playing and playing and eventually you are gonna get better. Um, and there's never really any suggestion of resting because there's not very much in it for you. It's probably fair to say that almost everywhere except for Dark Souls and PUBG, games are comparatively easy to get good at. A few hours of play, and even if you've never designed a roller coaster or fought a hell kite dragon before, you'll be adding inverted corkscrew sections or instinctively aiming for the thorax like a pro. Unfortunately, this ease just makes real life self improvement all the more jarring. So if you've ever made like a serious attempt to get good at anything, be it drawing or getting in shape or getting really, really good at Street Fighter 2, there probably came like this one point after the initial flush of rapid improvement where you suddenly realised how much work you were going to have to put in to get any better. I've seen this effect called effort shock and in real life it seems almost unfair because we've been taught by games and films that progress is easy and fast. Um, and when you're struck by it in real life, it's awful. I think the best example of it is probably Far Cry. You go from being like a hapless tourist in the second game to being a murderous stab machine in a matter of hours just by like fighting a few pirates and looting a few boxes. Whereas if you put that amount of work into say, drawing a horse, your horse drawing would only go from terrible stick figure to thing that isn't an actual insult to the concept of horses. And the problem with this is, Games have taught us to think that things are easy, and generally speaking, they're not. It seems almost unfair, and it's one of the reasons why a lot of semi-serious self-improvement plans seem to fail. The effort to reward ratio is so unfair compared to what we've been taught to expect by games and films, that it almost seems worth just sticking the Witcher on and going back to being a complete badass, rather than grinding it out in real life. Which is a shame, because all you really need to do is stick at it. There's a reason Level Down hasn't become a management buzzword. Apart from being a depressing concept, it's something that basically never happens in games. And yet, a refusal to acknowledge that progress happens in zigzags, or at the very least in a weird kind of wonky spiral, that could be what holds you back in real life. So one of the reasons that games are so magical is that there's almost no chance of backsliding. In the virtual world, once you've leveled up your stamina or become more punch resistant or learn to stab a man and then steal his gun and then shoot more guys while stabbing him again, there's almost no chance that you'll retreat to your old, uncoordinated, punch-allergic self. In real life, this isn't just painfully untrue, but it actually gets worse as you get better. If you've just gone from being a couch-dwelling Dorito Hoover to somebody who goes to the gym occasionally, that's not that difficult to maintain. But once you push up towards Olympian levels of achievement, almost any days off will make you much, much worse at the thing you're trying to do. Again, you can see why games don't do this, because any game where you constantly got worse if you didn't practice and hone your skills all the time would be massively confusing and irritating to play, and totally against the dynamic that we've all been reared to expect. Who doesn't love a side quest? Whether you're slaughtering your way through a mission that's far too tricky for the main game, or simply rounding up chickens for some half-wit of a farmer, they're the perfect way to decompress from the main business of ridding the land of uh, evil or, you know, whatever. But there's a crucial difference between real life and games that you're not even considering, and it's not helping anyone. No, <laughs> not even that farmer. Sure, lots of games force you to prioritise, but others dangle the golden carrot of full closure. The bonus outfit or extra ending that says you've left no crate unlooted, no enemy alive. IRL, this simply isn't a possibility. There's no 100% in life and you really need to learn to focus. But there's even more to it than that. If you're lost and directionless in a video game, getting back on track couldn't be simpler. Just walk around talking to people, some of them with exclamation marks over their head, 
and do odd jobs like some sort of mad altruistic mercenary come forager until you're back on track. In reality, not only is this insane, imagine wandering up to a crying stranger and offering to retrieve his goats, but accepting the real life equivalent of side quests from your boss or family members is likely to be completely counterproductive. But there's another thing to consider because multitasking really is a myth. What you're actually doing is task switching between one thing and another very rapidly and doing it all of them pretty badly. In one study, researchers found that even a little distraction can decrease your brain's ability to process information by about 20%. And in another, it took workers 23 minutes and 15 seconds to get back on task after even a little interruption to what they were doing. If you're trying to get better at something, spending a third of an hour every time you get distracted, just getting back onto the main task is gonna be really, really antithetical to your goals. Yes, in some games you start out at the bottom of the barrel. You're the medieval pot washer, freshly trained grunt or disposable clone who's thrust by circumstances into greatness. But in most, you're the chosen one, the legendary hero, or offspring of the main bad guy who's got greatness in his DNA or something. But believing that this is true of most successful people, or even yourself, can actually hamper your progress. So yeah, it's great to believe in yourself, but there's actually an enormous amount of research saying that if you believe in, like, natural ability or innate talent, then that leaves you with a mindset that's unmotivated to change and actually quite fearful of failure. When they've done tests on children, they've found that telling them that they're naturally good at something makes them actually less likely to take on challenging tasks or work harder when they're tested on things like maths or science. What you should actually do is emphasize the fact that they've worked hard or tell them that they're trying their best and that they can improve at things if they try and then you'll find that they're, they're motivated to work harder and that they'll always give things their best shot. In games where you're often told that you're the chosen one or that you're the only guy who can save everybody, this isn't always the case. Um, but it's an important thing to remember about real life. So there you go, seven gentle mistruths that games tell us about self-improvement. But that doesn't mean all games are bad for you. And in fact, we've covered seven games that are actually good for you in a previous video. Just click the link. Please let us know your top tips for levelling up in real life, give us a like if you learned anything, and subscribe to Logitech G for more weekly shows and features. Thanks for watching!